Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Kelly from the Business School, and I am the Director of External Engagement here. A very warm welcome to you all. But first and foremost, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we are meeting today. In particular, and on behalf of UQ, I'd like to acknowledge the Yagara people, traditional owners, of the land on which we meet here at UQ, conscious that people from all over the country are dialing into this fantastic webinar today. Uh, but we would like to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who contribute cultural and spiritual connections with country. We, we recognise in particular their valuable contribution to the university, to Australian and global society. So thanks again for joining us this evening. And you know the, the interest has been extraordinary. I understand there's about 600 people registered for this webinar, which is testament for the interest there is out there in understanding governance and boards, how to join them, how for those aspiring to join them, uh, what are the success factors involved, and what are the stories and war stories involved that you should be aware of as well, and what a stellar panel we have of our very amazing esteemed alumni out of this very school tonight. So I'm, I'm really proud, in fact, to welcome all of you on the panel tonight. We have Melanie Wilson, Jason Titman, Sue Key, and of course, Tim Wilson as well. So a very diverse panel uh, with a range and of experience, but extensive experience in governance at board level, executive level, startups, uh, you name it. So it's a very exciting conversation ahead. I do encourage you to use the Q&A function uh, you'll find on your screen as well during the conversation. Our intent here is to have a really open, fluid, candid conversation where you will find, I hope, really valuable insights into uh, some steps you might want to take uh, in this, on, on this question about how to join boards um, and what sort of skills are in demand, for instance, and what are the risks. And so do do that. And I will refer to some of those questions during the discussion. And then I'd like to, before we start out, just introduce uh, this amazing panel. Starting with Melanie. Melanie Wilson, welcome. I understand you're down in Sydney. We are missing the Sydneyites. I would like you, as we discussed earlier, I'd love you to come up and visit the, the reef and Queensland as soon as possible, Melanie. And we'd like to see you in person here at the university. So Melanie okay. has more than 12 years international retail experience in senior management roles with Woolworths, Starwood Hotels, Victoria's Secret and Big W. Melanie is currently an executive director of Pindell Proprietary Limited. Mel graduated from the University of Queensland with a Bachelor of Commerce honours and is a member of the Bell Alumni, Alumni Ambassador Council in Sydney. Mel has completed her MBA and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. She is a non-executive director on the board of JB Hi-Fi, Property Guru Group, EML Payments, Baby Bunting and I Select. So extensive experience, Melanie, welcome. Thank you. Jason Tittman. Jason Tittman has a portfolio career as well. He's dominated by building, which has been dominated, I should say, by building successful companies and exiting them at strategic points in time. I think he's understating that in his bio. He's done very, very well um, as an entrepreneur. He has done this across technology, professional services, retail and property verticals. Jason has a passion for helping people and companies scale to achieve their full potential, as well as also devoting significant time to several not-for-profit boards. His philanthropic passion centers around creating char charitable foundations and to enable people to get a start in life who may not otherwise have that opportunity. Jason completed his MBA at UQ and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Welcome, Jason. Sue Key. Sue, we also welcome you. She is the CEO of the, new, the newly formed Queensland AI Hub, of which UQ is a partner in with the Queensland Government and QUT. Uh, she, is an, she has an MBA from UQ and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Sue has a focus on disruptive technologies uh, and has set up the world's first robotic vision research centre 
and led the development of Australia's first robotics roadmap, outlining how robotics and automation will impact on every sector of the Australian economy. Sue chairs the board of Robotics Australia Group and serves on the board of the CRC for optimising resource extraction and Women in Robotics International and is responsible for bringing the Grace Hopper celebration to Australia. So Sue, we welcome you, uh, a woman in STEM and a leader in STEM, so uh, wonderful to see. Tim, Tim Wilson operates Kurtzon Consulting, which provides consulting services to growing private Australian companies. For 10 years, Tim ran Blue Sky Private Equity, a private equity business that invested upwards of $500 million in more than 30 Australian growth capital and venture capital businesses. As one of the founders, Tim played a senior role in growing Blue Sky Alternative Investments Limited from approximately Australian $100 million to over $4 billion. Tim completed his Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Law degrees at, here at UQ and also has postgraduate qualifications in finance. Tim has been very involved with Yallery for over 10 years, a charity focused, a wonderful charity I might add too, focused on furthering the the education of Indigenous Australians from regional and remote Australia. Tim is currently the chairman of Yallery's Northern Regional Council, which is a voluntary role. So th thanks again for all our panellists for joining us today. And I thought just to kick off, and I'd love to hear from each of you on this one, just beginning with telling us what led to your first board appointment and um, how did you know you were ready for a board appointment? Mel, we might start with you. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you for having me on this panel and um, welcome to all those who are watching and are um, inspiring board members. Uh, so I think for me, um, I probably went in a little bit earlier now um, when I look at it than I probably would have, but uh, I had been working at Woolworths actually for um, a number of years and I'd had quite a, a successful executive career um, over over you know, spanning my, my career in life and um, happened to be one day, my husband actually joined a board actually up in Brisbane of a, a listed company called Vita Group. And he came back from a board meeting and, and said to me, and Vita Group, for those who, who probably have not heard of it, it's actually a retailer. They run um, a number of Telstra stores and, and other retail concepts. Anyway, he came back to me and said, actually, he said, you know, you'd actually be much better on the board than I would be. So I sort of went, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I should start looking at uh, board roles. Um, and I think for me that the catalyst that really uh, drove me to move my career towards um, a board portfolio was um, I had two small children at the time, um, executive life. I was getting to a point I've been, I was quite burnt out. I was commuting a lot. I wasn't seeing my children a lot and I wanted to change um, my career direction at that point. So I think, uh, having, you know, having that sort of validation from my husband to say, actually, I think, you know, you'd actually be really good in doing this. Um, and then looking at my own career and thinking about where I should be going, that was something that was attractive. Um, I was luckily introduced to um, a company that was actually a private equity company that owned um, a large stake in a company called Baby Bunting, which is a, we're a listed company. They're just listed on the ASX. And they asked me if I'd like to join their board. And I think for me, that was a really obvious yes. And, I, and the reasons why is having two young children, I was a customer. I knew the customer journey. I understood that business back to front. It was a retail. So again, I, I have a, a huge amount of experience working for large retailers, both in the US and in Australia. So I felt like there was a huge amount of um, value I could add to them. And the role that I last had when I was at Woolworths was uh, on running e-commerce and digital for them. And Baby Bunting were uh, still quite a small company at that point. They only had 40 stores when I joined and e-commerce was still quite... Uh, they, were, they were not that advanced um, in terms of their e-commerce journey and they really were looking for someone who could help them. So I felt like all of the things I was doing in my current executive role, I could really add to their um, value and board. So I, that's, that's how I ended up on my first board role. That's a really interesting story, Mel. Thank you for that. And interesting to hear you say it wasn't only your 
skills and experience previous to that, but also the fact you were a customer of the company and understood that customer journey. I think that's a really interesting one that we'll come back to later. So thank you. Jason, can we ask you how you came across your first board appointment and how you knew you were ready? Well, I had a bit of a parallel experience, actually. Um, and uh, so, you're welcome, everybody. I'm certainly looking forward to uh, getting some board experience. Um, the other. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Mason. I'm so sorry, but your sound, there's a little difficulty there. Is there any way we could improve the sound? We might, while we're waiting for Jason to come back on, uh, we might go to Sue. Sue, would you like to tell us how you came across your first board role? Oh yeah, well I was completely clueless really, um, so I'm not sure I'd follow the same path that I took. Um, I, look, I had all the qualifications, so uh, I did work with Uniquest, which is UQ's research commercialisation arm, and they supported most of uh, the staff to do the Australian Institute of Company Directors course, mainly because there was an expectation that we would be involved with uh, UQ startups and that there would be probably a necessity for us to sit on boards. So, you know, I took that pretty seriously, but then, uh, you know, I left UniQuest and so hadn't had an opportunity to be on a board and was in the midst of another role. And I was advising a board on their intellectual property arrangements. And uh, someone that I knew from that um, organization came and asked me for some advice about um, a, a new board member that they wanted to put onto that particular board. And so I came up with, you know, a quite a extensive list of names and eventually my friend sort of took me aside and said, actually, we were hoping you'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know why I was so surprised, actually, but, um, you know, it was actually a, a very good fit for my capabilities. And I felt a bit disappointed in myself that I hadn't actually sort of thought to put myself forward for that opportunity. So I was lucky in that respect. I had had plans to try and join a board, but I think I'd also <clears throat> found it, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit... <clears throat> frustrating in terms of, well, what board exactly do I want to be in? And, you know, I think the lesson that I've learned from that is that, you know, you're, you're best, uh, you know, fishing in your own local area and, you, you know, you might actually know more people uh, who have the right connections to get you on a board than you realise. And in, in my case, you know, I actually needed a bit of a kick to, to get there. And I'm glad that I did. I, I always felt that I had uh, quite a bit to contribute in terms of input into strategy. And, uh, you know, since then I've gone on to, to form, um, you know, another company I'm the chair of and of that board. And um, yeah, it's uh, interesting. That's, and it is interesting to see this diversity of paths that have led you to your first boards or board appointments. Um, that is really interesting. And certainly um, something that a lot of us have experienced. I think either way, some boards uh, approach you directly through networks and for your skills and your experience and others it, it, you might need a lot of encouragement to join. And, and a lot of us don't realize maybe how valuable some of the skills and experience we have. So thanks, Sue. Fantastic. Jason, are you back? <laughs> We'd love to hear I'm you. back. Story. Hopefully everybody can hear. Does that sound better? A little bit, sound yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Oh, um, yeah, as I said, I have a bit of a experience. One was with my uh, sort of career, how well, that was going. And the other was I was actually mowing the lawn, and uh, a neighbour who was on the board of uh, Cycling Queensland at the time approached me, uh, younger than what I thought I would have been ready for a board, but he said, We're looking for somebody with good marketing skills and a good network. Um, one of the things they wanted to do was to get a couple of allodrome queens didn't have um so I, I spent a couple of years on that board first first real serious um board appointment um it was an interesting experience and from there probably a bit similar to Alan and, and soon the fact that yes it was tap on the shoulder to join in the board and that was an interesting one because the fellow director who invited me to join after with the chairperson with that conversation about two weeks uh, after that he um Nine, and there were issues at the board. So I was conducted by an interesting experience. So uh, that, that's my four to join board. Fantastic. No, that's that's good to hear that. Um, another different story. So I think we're seeing a theme here. There's very, very, there's many ways to skin this cat. So lastly, but not least, we've got Tim, Tim Wilson. Can you yeah, tell us your story? 
so I mean similar to Sue it was um you know it certainly wasn't something I was aspiring to at all and it sort of fell on in my lap I guess and, and the reason for me was that I, I um my career started out as a lawyer I then jumped across and became and worked in investment banking in London and, and um pretty early days of working in banking I um I guess sided myself with the private equity style of work so I always wanted to be in private equity and that was my big aspiration was to, get, to have a job in private equity given that I've been working quite closely with it took 10 years to get there, but ultimately I got there. And, and um, I guess the board, as I say, board, a board role wasn't something I was aspiring to, but as soon as you're in a private equity business and you're making investments, it absolutely comes with the program. So you know, before long, I've, uh, you know, I suddenly found myself on all sorts of boards and, and different boards, and they're all private company boards. So um, that, you know, that was one world and, 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 you know, and, and a very comfortable well-being. In, and then that evolved as, as um, Blue Sky grew and the funds management business that I was in grew. Um, we then listed that business and given that I was running one of the divisions and I was you know, effectively one of the first people there and was there from those early days, um, it was kind of natural for me to join the board of the, the listed parent company as well. So I joined, I was on some of the internal boards which then evolved into being on the parent company listed board and I was on that until uh, almost until the end. So I spent plenty of time on that board as well. Oh, thank you. Lots of great experience, Tim. Fantastic. I actually um, might st stay with you, Tim, for the next um, question that we wanted to talk about, which, you know, what do you wish you knew before you joined a board? And what advice would you have for aspiring non-executive directors out there? Oh, so there's two worlds, I guess. There's the private company boards, which, um, you know, a, 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 an easy decision and an easy transition to make because it's typically quite small and very collegiate and Certainly, on any of the private company boards I've ever been involved in, they were always very uncontroversial. So it was a, you know, it was a, we would certainly debate things, but we never pulled out shareholder agreements and never had to have arguments. But um, conversely, listed company boards, you know, if people know the Blue Sky story, it wasn't easy. So, um, you know, we had a, a it was part of building this fantastic business on the board from those early days. We had a very much sort of an internal board, which gradually evolved into being partly internal, partly external. But um, the last couple of years of that were pain. So I guess. In some senses, for the audience, um, you know, and I, I imagine the position of most of the audience is that they're very keen and to learn about boards and potentially join boards one day. Um, I would guess, from the, the last year or so of my time on the board of Blue Sky, it's not all beer and skittles. It was a you know, it was a pretty traumatic time. Um, the business um, underwent a major short selling campaign, the likes of which has never been kind of seen in Australia. It was played out in the newspapers on a daily basis. Um, I think in the in a period of six months after the short selling campaign began, we had 35 board meetings, which, you know, in six months, you usually had five, maybe six, you know, it was, it was out of control. We had some of them with, you know, from lunchtime through till, you know, mid morning the next day, it was, you know, it, it was hell and it was hell within the business as well. So, you know, shareholders got damaged, investors um, in the, the, in the funds that we were in got damaged, the businesses that we were invested in that were all, well, not, I mean, almost, you know, we had, we had a good investment track record. We had some great companies in that portfolio but they suddenly became collateral damage. So, you know, partly, you know, it was hard wearing an, wearing a, an executive hat, but it was very hard wearing a board hat as well. So um, I think, you know, there's, there's a bunch of things which I guess my advice and, and, and to people considering going on boards is to go in with eyes wide open and eyes wide open in the sense that there are some things which are very inherent in listed company boards, which is scary. You know, there's, there's short selling, there's class actions, there's shareholder activism, um, there's director's liabilities, you know, so um, my advice and my learning is go in with your eyes wide open, um, but still, like it was, and, and, you know, a very rewarding, very rewarding thing to do other than the last year of pain, I guess I'd say. So round off at that, Sarah. Oh, well, look, I think, I mean, we really appreciate that candid response, Tim, and honestly, a lot of us have had experiences that illustrate that very risky situation that any board is, particularly a listed company. Uh, there are inherent risks, as you pointed out, across all different types of companies from startups to government to, and we now know with the latest legislations around this, you know, how um, risky that can be, including oversight of cultural um, issues or oversight off the back of the national inquiries, you can land you in prison. Uh, and I'm not saying that was your case, but I'm just saying <laughs> it eliminates the broader discussion that we should absolutely bring to tonight's discussion that there is a lot of risk inherent in boards and and that is actually a side you need to as you said Tim you know enter with your eyes open 
So that's really valuable advice. You know, we really appreciate it. And um, you'd be great on any board because you've learned so much, I imagine, with all those experiences. It's tough. But Sue, can I ask you uh, for the same, you know, um, what are some of the risks or the advice you wish you had before you started on a board that you would give now to others aspiring for that? Yeah, yeah, I think Tim really summed it up. It's not all beer and Skittles. I think that some people maybe have a, a false impression that boards, you know, just get to really review the main management decisions and play an advisory role. But it really depends on how well things are going. And if you've got a, a great exec team, then yeah, it probably can be pretty cushy. But you know, then there, there is no limit on the time that you might have to invest in something, particularly if it starts going bad. And, you know, if you this, you think this buck stops with the CEO, but you know, the CEO can leave and then it's the board that has to pick up all the pieces ultimately. And I think that you have to be ready to take on that responsibility if you want to be on a board. Um, and yeah, it's not maybe, I think some people have uh, potentially a, you know, a, an ideal vision of, of what being on a board is all about. And, um, you know, I guess we heard from Mel that, you know, in terms of lifestyle, that was a, was a good choice. But I think that, you know, depending on how well the company is working, sometimes it, it can end up being a, a lot of work. Yeah, that's, that's also really good advice. Thank you. It sounds like a very common theme there as well to really do your research, understand and appreciate from your education and your own experience, the very real risks of joining boards. Uh, there is a lot of upside, of course, too, as we've heard from all of you tonight as well. So Mel, we might go to you next uh, on this one, which is, you know, how do you, what sort of boards, how do you know what type to apply to and what is the best way to do it? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I just want to go back on something that Sue said and then I'll answer that sure. question. Sue, so, um, as much as my moving to board roles was lifestyle choice, it's actually a full-time job. And I actually work probably more hours now, funnily enough, than I was doing when I was a full-time exec. So getting back to it's, um, it, it, the job is more demanding and the hours, and I do board calls some nights at 11 o'clock at night and, and you have to be on it every, at any time a board call is, is um, done. But I can at least do that from my home and I have a family that is well and understanding of that. But anyway, getting on to the next question, I just wanted to rate that because I don't want anyone yeah. to think that I've done it as a lifestyle choice and it's, and it's you know, all roses because it's not and I've been through some pretty um, stressful stuff on, on boards as well. Um, but I think when it comes down to, in, in terms of my, um, the way I've looked at boards is I've gone, because it, there's a couple of things that I think about. One, you're on a board for a long time, like a listed company, you're off and on for six to nine years. Um, when you go, when you choose a board, you want to be with a business that you understand fundamentally. I get asked to go on all kinds of boards, but I will only really go on a board where I actually really have a good understanding of what that business does. And, and you can learn that going onto the boards. But for me, when you are, when the buck stops with you, you really do need to understand every part about that business, every aspect, whether it's the IT, how their IT systems work, whether it's what the customer, what the end customer um, is needing. So I choose businesses that I'm both passionate about and love because when you're in the shits and probably like Tim has been and it's and everything's going to hell and you're having some uh, fairly difficult discussions with other board members and management team, you've actually got to really love the business and love what they do and be passionate about wanting to be on the board. Um, there's no point joining a company that you don't uh, feel that way about in, in my view because um, you know, you, you'll soon lose interest and you won't want to be on the board. And, and, and to be your reputation, you've also got to manage your own reputation as well, not just the reputation of the company, but you can't, I've seen uh, some board members that chop and change boards um, and that doesn't go down well. I've invested in these companies for a very long time and that's the way I view those businesses and I'm in here for the long run. So, um, you know, that's the way I think about it. That's really good advice, Mel. Thank you, uh, especially that bit about the long, the long range view and investing in the long run as a key human resource asset and leader in, in these companies. At which well, also our, also our yeah. shareholders are investing for yeah. the long term. So, you they know, you've that got to... That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's that's very good advice. And particularly in the middle of a crisis or this pandemic, <laughs> there's other there's other crises. We know that. So to have that long term view is everything, especially from leadership in companies and and boards. So great advice. Thank you, Jason. Back to you. Yeah. What look, I'll, of, sorry. What do you want to add? You want to add to this conversation? Uh, uh, then I'm going to ask another question coming. Yeah. Look. I'll add really quickly, um, Sarah, so we can keep it flowing. I mean, to Melanie's point, I, I think one thing that people need to understand about getting on the board is if you don't understand the language, you can't have the conversation. Um, and I think as board directors, you know, we can't be subject matter experts everywhere, but we have to get ourselves up to speed with the issues that the board's tackling. Um, and, and picking up from, from him's point and Sue's is when the company's going well, you probably almost end up spending less time. But when something goes wrong and there's an issue, it's it's all in. And that's what my experience has been. That's when you really start to, to, to see how your fellow board members handle themselves, how the exec handle themselves. And, you know, on the last point, I don't forget about de facto director provisions. I'd encourage everybody to be aware of that. Um, you know, maybe not quite the case with the listed companies, but, you know, a lot of the not-for-profits and other institutions and privates that they're getting involved with, you can actually get yourself quite caught up. So, um, yeah. But no, happy to take my next question. <laughs> well, it was really along those lines of, you know, are there any particular skills that you think are absolutely necessary to bring to board, regardless of the type of board? Yeah, look, look. I, I think I think it's about have being almost able to have that helicopter view of the organisation. Um, you know, moving from an executive role when you're really in there and doing it um, to the board role. So it's it's about having a much bigger holistic perspective. Um, I think it'll probably it's very good to have good emotional intelligence as well. Um, and I find, you know, if, if, if the chairperson and CEO, for example, are blocking you or blocking executive from speaking to the board, you know, it's generally a sign that there's something else happening. Um, so I think it's that ability as well, as I said, to, to have a good emotional intelligence and understanding um, that it's not always as all that it sees because as a board you don't generally get the same level of detail as executive but you're actually equally responsible so um, yeah I, th I think don't underestimate your ability to process information pretty quickly and look outside the box for information that might actually not be flowing up to you on the board right yeah that's that is really good advice those communication lines become very important, don't they, around doing your due diligence as we're legally required to do at board level? How do you get that vision? How do you get that information across every part of the business? It's very hard. And, very and hard. I and I've seen sometimes, you know, executives getting blocked coming to boards. Um, I've also seen the, the the reverse where executives want to feed that much information to the board and say, oh, well, here, you've got it now. Uh, it's not our responsibility anymore if something happens in this particular area. So, you know, I, th I think that can be a, a challenge for boards to manage or realise if they're actually being managed by the executive team sometimes. Um, so, uh, yeah, look, I, I, I think I would sort of encourage, you know, board members and, and potential board recruits to kind of look at look at those sorts of um, side angles. That's interesting. And so how do you discern that if you are on a board? How, how can you discern that what, practically? So if you're interviewing for a board role, this sort of question could be asked, you know, where you, you, are, you are feeling there is something uh, that you are not receiving in communications or the leadership or the executive somehow there's tensions there. What do you say? And, you know, so I think it's a good question, actually. I think the first point of reference to start from is to remember that, that generally everybody on the board, every director is equally responsible. We, we certainly elect a chairperson, um, but we're all equally responsible uh, and can be equally liably responsible as well. Um, what I would say is that <clears throat> if you're getting to the board level, usually you've had some pretty good subject matter or, or vertical experience in particular in your executive career. Um, so hopefully you will be fairly switched on to the different nuances in an organisation. Um, but what I'd be encouraging um, the individuals to do is, is to start some more probing and, and you have to be careful because one of the big issues that I find that is a challenge at board level and I saw it in the Q&A earlier there is about groupthink and it's probably another topic but but it, it, it can be a negative of boards groupthink. Um, the other side of things is typically 
you know, board members won't always all get on um, and, and you want a good level of, of challenging conversations. But the longer you're together as a board, the more comfortable you get. And at the end of the day, we're individuals. So that, that idea of challenging um, the chairperson or challenging fellow directors or even challenging the CEO is something that can be, you know, personally that you've got to be aware of that you're going to potentially need to do it. Um, so it is about asking through the chair to the CEO that, that you want to see some deeper reports in a particular um, department or something like that and starting to kind of bring it or, or even ask for that executive to come to a future board meeting and present a presentation. So I think that's probably, as, as a short answer, one of the ways that I go about um, extracting that if I want to do some more. Thanks, Jason. That's fantastic. And, and Tim, can you add to that at all? And another question I'd have for you, Tim, on top of that, is aside from the skills that you think are needed when you're interviewing people for board roles, potentially, or being interviewed uh, that you think are important. Uh, I think secondly, you know, how do you expand your board network once you are on a board? We're getting that theme through here on the Q&A a bit. Uh, so, I mean, I guess two different things. One, on the, the skills front, um, I think there's a lot of people that say would have a background out of you know, law and, and finance. And I think, um, my tip would be like, and that's my background, right? So I'm a finance guy and I used to be a lawyer way back. Um, I think there are a dime a dozen on boards and I think you've got to be, my, my sort of sense of building a board is you want people who aren't just in that world, you know, I think you need definitely people who have the deep industry experience um, and, you know, a, a mixture of, you know, the, the better the mix is on the board, the better. Like I just don't, you know, I think you've got to avoid having too many people who are just uh, very focused on governance and, and, um, you know, the legal aspects of running a board meeting. Um, then, um, uh, I mean, that's the skills question. Sorry, what was the other question, Sarah? Oh yeah, so that was the skills question. And then, um, you know, if you're already on a board, how do you expand that network if you're looking to increase your portfolio as a non-executive director? How do you do that? What are some tips? Uh, I mean, that, that's a, that, I mean, that's such a tricky one. And it's funny, when I've met people in my career, people have worked for me and, and, and all across is that, um, I guess I've always been noted as having a strong um, network and it's not necessarily something that I have, um, you know, waking up one day saying, okay, I'm going to be well networked and tomorrow morning I'm going to jump out of bed and shake everyone's hand and give them a big easy smile or whatever. I mean, my, my, um, my advice to anybody on building a network, you know, whether you're introverted or extroverted is just push yourself out there to meet people in all scenarios. So, you know, my, I, you know, and I, I do have a reasonably strong network, but I think it's because I've just, you know, thrown myself into anything that I've been involved with, whether it be work or whether it be, you know, sport or charities or anything. Okay? And, and, um, and if I'm invited to anything, I'm typically the last person there, partly because I like, you know, maybe it's because I like beer, but no, no, no I, I actually, I really enjoy people's company, but don't always, like definitely, like sometimes I want to just go home and see the wife and kids and have a quiet night, but I'm invited to something. If I'm invited to something, I'll always go to it and make a point of, of you know, doing things against my will. Um, because invariably something good comes of it, whether it's a good conversation. I mean, I, I just, I never know, but I, I always, 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 always push myself out there to, you know, to attend and do anything and be, and be involved and be wholeheartedly involved in anything I get involved with. And, and I mean, I, that's probably sounds a bit cheesy, but it's, you know, it's, it's fun too, to be honest. I actually enjoy being involved in everything. It's, it's not cheesy at all. And in fact, you know, it, it actually, from certainly my experience on the boards I've been appointed to, a lot of it does come down to the networking and the willingness as part of your job almost uh, to, to stay in touch with people and meet people and go to these sorts of events where you might meet someone new and have an interesting conversation like you're saying. It's, it's worthwhile if you just meet one person at that event who becomes you know, a friend or an advocate or a sponsor or introduces you to two other people who are involved on boards. So it really is worth devoting a lot of time to that. So I totally agree with you, Tim. Mel, can we ask you that question as well? How do you extend your port, your non-executive directorship portfolio? Yeah, so I think um, I, I absolutely agree with Tim. And I think when I first, when I left my executive career, I did a lot of coffees. 
Um, and I didn't even drink coffee back then, I do now. Um, so I spent a lot of time working, you know, connecting with people who I didn't know very well, and but I knew that they would help with connections into boards and coffee, just telling people where I was taking my career. And, and you know, some, a couple of those did lead to things. I think now in a listed board space, most of the boards that I sit on now, I chair REM committees, we actually use recruiters. Um, and there are a number of uh, all the large recruiting companies all now have a board practice. I think um, gone are the days where you just give a board role to your best mate um, or your friends on the boards. I think there are processes that are now being run to try and um, increase the pool of diversity around directors, um, not just female, but uh, across the board in terms of skills. Um, and now the way often, and I think this gets back to Dim's point, when we sit down and work out whether we need a new director, we will work out what is the skill set we're looking for. And often it's very specific. So it might be legal, it might be someone who's got finance, but it actually might be someone who's um, customer marketing, uh, e-commerce and digital. So that's what I would, um, that's sort of my skill set. So people see me as a digital uh, and e-commerce um, person. Um, we're, we're looking recently at someone specifically in supply chains. Um, so I think knowing what your skill set is and what value you can bring to the table, I think, um, and really driving that point, I think will help. But um, but definitely if you are, if you are looking to move on to some boards, you know, start talking to headhunters because in the same way, you know, I get called a lot from headhunters. And uh, the one thing I will say is I've come on some very big boards. I've come to number two and missed out. And it literally is heartbreaking. You you know, these are the jobs I want, but it's like any job, you win and lose. And I've lost quite a lot that I haven't, you know, someone more skilled got and you've got to just take that and go, okay, I didn't get on that board. But you know, there's there's other opportunities or maybe at, a, at another point in time. So these are all things to, you know, to think about when you're, um, you know, in discussions with boards. Thank you. Yeah, good advice again from everyone. This is great, great conversation. Sue, I think we're over to you. We're getting quite a few questions there I'm noticing around, um, is there, you know, people who have the executive experience, life experience to bring to boards, the specific skills we've just been talking about, is there an additional course you're, you would recommend, something like the AICD or perhaps another one that is needed in your opinion? Does it come into the conversations in recruitment? Well, um, no, I haven't experienced that. I, I mean, I think it is useful to do the um, Australian Institute of Company Directors course, but I don't think it's necessarily a prerequisite for all boards. I mean, it, 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 it really very much depends on the type of board that you're on. Um, you want to make sure that you do have some people who are, are really very focused on the corporate governance aspects. But as Tim pointed out, you don't want a full board of worth of those. So um, uh, I really think it's more around uh, being clear about what it is that you want. So back to some of the points uh, the rest of the panel have made. Um, you know, using those networks, being clear about what your skills are and what you can contribute and telegraphing your intentions. So if people don't know that you're interested in other board positions, then they can't be in a position to help you to get those. But I'm not sure. I mean, I think if you're confident in your strategy skills, that's probably the only thing I'd really recommend that you feel, you know, confident that you can contribute in. Okay, that's great. What about, I mean, from your point of view, you're, you're just the guru of STEM. You're amazing. So, you know, would you say in this day and age, things like the cybersecurity, things like artificial intelligence and ethics around that, perhaps, uh, you know, privacy issues around that, do you think these sorts of skills are needed at board level? Yeah, definitely. I think that they are also the sort of skills that you can, you know, get some advisors to come in and help if, if you need to, but it's, it's handy to have people with a technology background on boards to advise on those matters as well. Mm. And what about, I've touched then on the <laughs> ethics piece. Uh, we actually have a, a research concentration. One of them, one of our pillars in the school is on trust, ethics and governance. Uh, but the ethics piece off the back of all these national inquiries we've seen recently seems to be coming into play, you know? So how do you assess the integrity of your fellow directors on a board or incoming directors? How do you assess that? Is it a reputational word of mouth thing or how do you do those checks? Probity well, checks, in other words. 
Yeah, well, I'm not on the board of a listed company, so I, I can only imagine that they may be having more rigorous processes. But, you know, my board experience has been mainly um, where people really have to have quite a, a, a deep trust in the other people and, and uh, I guess, know of them, have, of ha having them them having been in those circles for some time, which also then means it's very hard as a new person to break into those circles. Um, and so I think that's probably a very old fashioned way of doing it, um, but I'm maybe not the best person to comment on a more rigorous process. And Jason, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, look, probably same as doing, not in terms of the rigor that all recruits maybe go through, but, but I think, uh, you know, we can't hear very Sorry? well. We we can't hear you too well. Still? Oh, that's better. That's better. Is that is that better? Okay. Sorry, everyone. Not sure what's happening this evening. Um, yeah, from from a rigorous point of view, uh, recruits do. I'm not entirely sure, but my experience being you're right. That rigor of due diligence is really important because, and maybe Melanie touched on this earlier. It's actually quite hard to get people off board probably easier to get rid of executives and it is a board member who tend to go on for a while, so it's really important. Actually speaking to other other directors where they are on boards, if they've been on board before, uh, that definitely happens. I've been involved in that. We, you know, several of the boards that I've been involved in, we're looking at bringing new directors on. We've asked, uh, you know, who knows people in their network and we've definitely gone and done our own individual due diligence because um, it's been something that we've been very, very conscious of. Of, um, you know, the reputation of the organisation, the importance of, of the, the brand equity, um, and like I said, the difficulty of you get somebody that doesn't have shared values, shared sort of cultural views, um, then, uh, you know, and it's not about diversity, it's just about, you know, like being a good person. Uh, it's, it's really challenging to have them on board. So I think the more diligence you do, up front, the more important. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. It's um, does anyone want to add to that one? You know how you determined whether you trust fellow board members when you're joining a new board or when you're interviewing someone to join your board. Mel, uh, I can give you my experience. Well, some of the things that we do. So at a listed space, um, we do a lot of black background checks. So especially when you go through recruiters, like you would with the CEO coming on board, there's a lot of. Um, extensive background checks. Um, we also do a lot of referencing checks. Um, and I think one of the things that I have changed the way I give references, personal references now um, in with people I've worked with um, once you become on a board because you really actually do need to know. Um, sometimes it's not just good enough to say, yeah, that you think they're a good candidate. I actually now give very specific um, details of of um, instances of where I work with them and, and my viewpoints because now I need to know that information on the other side. So I think I've changed the way um, I look at that. So uh, that's probably the way. And, and, you know, we also, if we know anyone in connection, I mean, LinkedIn's great. You can see who's connected. Someone on the board might be know someone who knows that person. So all those sort of checks. Um, but I think one of the key things that I would point out, and I think Tim raised it earlier is, when you're on boards, um, you may not get along with everyone. Um, and I have turned down boards where I've seen that I know I won't get along with someone on that board. And I know that we will, it will become very challenging. Um, and I sit on a board where most of the boards, are, you know, I have a very good relationship with the other board members. There's one board where there's one board member and I, we probably butt heads more than I would like, but I've sort of got used to that person and I respect his views and I hope that he respects mine, but that's just, you know, it's, it makes it a more difficult um, uh, conversation. But again, you know, when you're working with that person over a number of years, you've got to, you know, you want to, you want to work with people 
that you enjoy being around because when you're on an 11 o'clock call in, at night about something very stressful, the last thing you need is someone that you don't want to be there with um, because it makes it very hard. So when you are interviewing, you need to interview with every board member as well as um, the key management team. And I would, um, if you're not sure, you know, you can have coffees or with the other board members, you can meet them. And, you know, like anyone, you, you meet someone and you can pick up quick, pretty quickly on people's vibes, whether you, you think you're going to be able to sit in a room with them um, for a long time. Thank you. That's um, interesting. And it is such a, especially at the ASX listed boards, you know, such a robust process that you just talked us through, extraordinary. But that being said, uh, you would argue, and this refers to one of the last questions I'll ask tonight about, you know, what is the difference between sitting on a not-for-profit board and uh, a government or an ASX listed board or a private company for that matter? Uh, can we talk through that? I might go to Tim on this one first. So my experience in, in um, charitable land is it's um, very like-minded and people are all there for the, the, the right purposes. Um, I don't, you know, sometimes I guess in that world, there are people who um, less experience in borderland, but they're so genuinely keen to help and keen to, to provide and do something. So it's, it's a very nice world. It's a, you know, it's a great world to work in. Um, I think private company land is also a good world. Like, I think I've sort of touched on it before, but we used to um, always sign these rigorous, long debated um, shareholders agreements and um, govern the board structures and how we would operate the boards. And then never in my whole time did we ever pull out the shareholders agreement to work out what we we're allowed to do and how we voted because we would always find a way through any issue by just getting along very well. Um, the, the same thing applied even in the listed land. For my one listed board experience, we, we had an unbelievably you know, strong and, and a board that pulled together very well and we were put under extreme pressure and still pulled together. Um, but um, you know, my, my, my experience in that is not that the board didn't function well, the, the board definitely functioned very well. My experience in that it was just it was hard, right? So you know, that, that's a, a tricky and, and, and hard world to navigate as I touched on earlier, so. Thanks, Tim, thank you. Uh, look, there are so many great questions. Thank you, audience, for all these fantastic questions, food for thought. I think we need another one of these events to, to answer all the questions. Uh, very, very tricky, but hopefully we've canvassed most of the common themes among those questions. Uh, if not, uh, feel free to, free to contact the school with some of the questions and we'll get back to you. But I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank all of our amazing panellists for tonight. That was really candid valuable insight. It's everything we hoped for, certainly from my perspective, and I hope from the audience as well. Uh, so, so much collective experience there. And we really, we thank you for that because I'm conscious, particularly this year, time is, is really tough and attention is hard in this attention economy. So thank you for that time and, and sparing that for us. And we are so proud of you as alumni. So do stay in touch. Uh, so, um, I'll thank you there. And then I did want to um, talk a little bit about a few other events the school is running uh, coming up, which are really important. Um, firstly, the MBA information webinar is coming up uh, and that is on Thursday, the 8th of October from four to five and Tuesday, the 10th of uh, November, 12 to one. So um, AICD graduates also uh, can gain some credit into the MBA. So it's a really exciting opportunity in partnership with them. We also have, and this is really exciting because I am one of the co-leaders with Professor Nicole, Nicole Gillespie of the Trust Ethics and Governance Research Alliance we now run in the school. And this is our inaugural summit. And honestly, the speakers are amazing. We've got two industry uh, combined academic panels starting out for the day. Then we'll have lunch. It's all at the Brisbane Club, so really easy to drop by. And I do encourage you to either um, drop by um, with, you've got to register, of course, online. Kate will send you the links uh, tomorrow for this. We are now offering, because it is a week away, some very limited face-to-face -face tickets for next Thursday, the 8th of October, half day or full day, as well as virtual tickets for free for MBA alumni. So given the interest you've shown for this session, I think this day will really dig deep uh, in a deeper analysis, both industry-led and research-led. So please join us. And if you sign up in the next 24 hours, I will give away tickets to tomorrow night's 
preliminary final against well between the Tigers and the Brisbane Lions at the Gabba. Two tickets. So get online, register for this seminar tomorrow when Kate sends you through uh, the links. And finally, we also have a new fantastic alumni network platform called A2A, aptly named, you would say. And it's a flash mentoring platform as well, helping you to connect with the global alumni community, which is, as you've seen from the panelists tonight, absolutely extraordinary. The value that our business school has and UQ has more broadly uh, across the world in our alumni. So going back to that networking, point and willingness to learn, I would say, too, and find sponsors um, for your career goals and career development is so important, spending that time on it. So please join as a mentor, a mentee or a peer coach on this platform and share your experiences so you can build those essential hard and soft skills. So you'll see there on the slide the link there to look up. So lots of exciting things happening. And again, um, I'd really like you to be able to, uh, you know, to join us, uh, whether it's next week at the summit, the MBA information night, uh, or um, through you, the new alumni network platform, we do, mentoring platform, we'd really like you to stay in touch. The contact points are all up there on the slide, um, lots of ways to make contact. Please also answer the link uh, that you'll see uh, sent to you very soon from our team, asking for your feedback on this session. And thank you for your time again and for joining us. We really appreciate it. We'll see you around soon. Thank you.